our country can do for you. The only thing we have to do is fear itself. Ask what you can do for your country. here with me in the room and who will be viewing this at some point in the future. Um, it's an honor to be here to make this presentation today. It's an area that is, is very close and dear to my heart. And especially when I can share my thoughts with officers to be, um, junior officers, and maybe some non-commissioned officers will, will get a chance to watch this because we have leaders at all levels in our army. Uh, which I think is one of the things that sets us apart from armies around the world. We encourage leadership from PFC all the way up to general officer, and that's what makes us special. So today I just want to share some of my thoughts on leadership. Um, my life, um, as I will talk to you, has been pretty, um, explaining, has been pretty um, unlikely in terms of how getting to this point. I never expected to be a general officer. It wasn't something I set out to do as a lieutenant. Um, quite frankly, as I'll tell you later, I didn't even intend to join ROTC. It was an accident. Well, I'll tell that story in a little bit. But, um, but I just want to share a couple basic things that I think are important to remember for leaders. I don't want it to be a super long list. It's just four things. Communication. And you may say, well, that's pretty obvious. But the key about communication is, you know, you've got to be transparent with those that you work with and serve. I could say, that you're subordinates, but you really work with and serve with other people. Um, you need to listen. That's part of communication as well. It may sound um, strange, but listening is a part of communication. Compassion. Being a compassionate and empathetic leader. Really letting your soldiers know that you care about them. And we all know the inauthentic leaders. We know who's real and who's not. Um, and while they might try to hide it, 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 it eventually comes out that they're not really empathetic. They're not good at providing feedback. They're not good at caring about the people that work with and for them. Clear expectations. People are going to fail if they don't know what you really expect. You may think you're being clear, um, but if people don't have a chance to ask questions, and that doesn't allow them to be successful. And then the last things that I'll talk about and probably emphasize throughout my remarks is your integrity and your honesty are non-negotiable. You have to be an honest person and you have to have integrity and moral courage. And sometimes that can be very difficult. And I'm going to share a story about something that happened to me that was really hard, but to this day I know it was the right thing. It worked out. It might have turned out very badly for me, very, 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 very badly for me, but it didn't. So I'm going to get started here. Um, first slide. We all start somewhere. I like these two baby pictures of myself because sometimes people I think look at me and I'm 64 years old and they're like, she was never a baby. Yes, I was. And I was a pretty cute baby. Um, at least my mom thought so. Um, but as you go through life, stuff happens and then middle school happens. Next slide. Oh, middle school, man. I mean, whoa, that was a scary time. Now, I've been in groups where people ask for this to a bunch of Girl Scouts and they all kind of giggled. I said, you know your pictures are ugly, just like these are ugly. I mean, we all have that ugly phase, and you think, I'm never going to get through this. I just, and meanwhile, there's people in your class who just look fabulous all the time. But I like to say, they've already peaked. <laughs> if you go to your, your high school or college reunion 20 years later, they look like they were rode hard and put out wet. So, so it does get better. Next slide. They really, really do get better. So 1975, that was me as a high school junior. And then that was me uh, when I was uh, at, the, at the Pentagon. Um, things do get better. You kind of I grew into my face, I'll, I'll say. I grew into everything. Uh, but things really do get better, and I got through some of those hard times and not having a lot of confidence in myself, not believing in myself. Um, and I will explain a lot about that in the next, the next slide. So I was, what I'll say truly, was an unlikely leader. Um, I actually am probably the only person you will meet who flunked kindergarten. They held me back from first grade. The teacher told my mom that I was slow. Um, now, that could have been very discouraging for me, and it may have been, could have been discouraging for her too, but she was off to work with me at home. Now, I wasn't slow. I was already reading at five, but somehow the teacher didn't notice that. 
Um, I don't know what it was, maybe I ate the glue stick. I don't know, something told her I was slow. So, um, and I, so as a consequence of that though, I was kind of shy, I didn't speak up in class. I knew the answers, but I just wasn't gonna give it up. But luckily I had teachers who could tell. They could look at me and say, oh, I think she already knows the answer. I tried to play sports, because my mom encouraged that to teach me about teamwork. I tried playing volleyball, got a lot of jam thumbs, really don't like volleyball. Um, softball, I have terrible depth of perception. They put me in right field, the ball would invariably go by me or hit me in the head. So, but I was out there trying, I did try. And I had a few friends, I just wasn't really trusting of people. Um, you know, so I was very selective in, in terms of, and to this day I still have people that I really count as my good friends that I know I can count on. I don't have a lot of acquaintances because you don't want to share certain things with people who are really not good friends. I get okay, I got pretty good grades in college. It was enough to get me into uh, law school, but they weren't straight A's. Uh, and I had some classes that I just did terribly and I didn't like math um, and had to really struggle for some of those things. And I absolutely didn't have a real plan for my life. I knew I wanted to maybe go to law school, study law, but it was all kind of vague. I didn't really have a strategic approach to this. So the, how I got into ROTC, which really and truly, it sounds corny, but it's true, it changed my life. It changed the trajectory of my life, and it brought out things I did not know existed in me as a person. So back in the day, 1977, when I was in college and registering for classes in a big old gym because we didn't have computers. You had to line up and sign up. That's how it worked. You lined up and you signed up. So I needed a science credit. At this college I went to, Creighton University, they required everybody to graduate with a science credit. So you had to use astronomy, biology for dummies, but you had to take a science. Well, I worked at night. And the one thing I really wanted to take was astronomy, so I couldn't do that. So I'm standing in this gym looking around. The lines are long for some of the classes that I, was again, wanted to take. But there was one table, and there was nobody in line. It had a sign on it and said ROTC, some initials. I didn't know what that was. But under it was the kicker. It said Military Science Department. I said, oh, science. So I'm, I run over. There's this great master sergeant sitting there. Master sergeant's a great salesman. He had some posters behind him of people jumping out of airplanes or repelling. And as I said to myself, oh, they're, they're walking through the woods. Oh, that was land nav, but I found out that later that was land, it was serious stuff. And so he explained it to me, it met in the mornings. That's great, I was a morning person. Um, you know, and it's, I said, is it like physical education? He said, oh yeah, it's like gym. I went, oh, okay. I'm still clueless. And, um, and the last thing that really got me was, he said, well, and they'll, they'll pay you a stipend to go to class. Now that word was not in my vocabulary. I said, what's a stipend? He said, well, they pay you $100, $100 a month. Some of you are gonna laugh, that was, that was a lot of money in 1977. Go, I said, just to go to class? And I'm thinking, I'm calculating, I need a new car. I thought I could find a car for, for 90 bucks a month. This was 1977. I did it too. And that's how I got my car to get me to my part-time job was I signed up for ROTC. The rest is history. It was, it was great. I met some really interesting people, other students at my school that I never would have met because they weren't in my, my political science major, so they weren't in any of my classes. Um, I learned about military history. We got to play with literal sand tables and move you know, little green men around. That was kind of fun, and, you know, and I, this is kind of cool. And we would have sometimes field training exercises. They made me the S4 later on, which was really a mistake on their part, but I, I, I sucked it up and I did it. But that really changed my life. I learned about military history and leadership, and I had some wonderful PMSs who were very encouraging. Um, one story I tell people is, I was really depressed as I said my grades were not at the level I thought they should be. I wasn't getting straight A's. And I was taking, had taken some course, and I think I got like a C plus or a B minus in it. And I was sitting in his office, moaning and groaning about this grade I was gonna make it. I can't ever go to law school, I keep doing this. And I'll never forget, he looked at me and he said, Jeanette Mahan, do you think anybody's gonna ask you in 15 years what grade you got in Theology 104? And I went, Oh, probably not. He says, then don't worry about it. He said, it's what you do after you leave with the skills you've learned here that are going to matter, people are going to care about. So I began to stop obsessing about my grades. Another good reason to go to ROTC. Next slide. So along the way, I'll admit, I made some mistakes. Um, and I'll talk about each one of those. 
um, as I as I as I in the next few minutes. Um, and I'm not saying that they're super. They were um, mistakes that you know were 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 you know that horrible. But they kind of held me back in some ways from excelling. Uh, I thought that simply doing a good job was enough. Now, as I mentioned, I came into RLTC, didn't even know what it was, so now I'm a commissioned officer, I'm in my first unit, and I was a bit of reservist for most of my, well, for the majority of my career, except when I was activated and mobilized a couple of times. So, I was a true citizen soldier. And I didn't have anybody in my family who I could talk to. My dad served in the Korean War, but he was enlisted. And he, he wasn't drafted, he, he enlisted. I had an uncle who served in Vietnam, he volunteered for Vietnam, but again, he was, a, he was an NCO, so he couldn't, he really didn't want to talk about Vietnam with me. Um, so I didn't really have a family history of people who had served. So I didn't have any generals or captains or anybody in my family who would talk to me about being an officer and being a leader in that, in that sense. So I just thought I could just come in and just do a good job and it'd be great. Well, the problem was I didn't always know what some of my peers knew about how this all works. The, the secret playbook that you kind of either grow up with or someone shares with you. And so I was just focused on doing a good job. But that was, in many cases and in instances, very good. Because I was going to exceed it and I was going to excel at whatever assignment I was given. And I was going to work really hard. But there are other little things. I was never very um, political. So I didn't know about schmoozing, they call schmoozing. Um, you know, but I also didn't feel comfortable doing it and kind of felt like, that's not the, that shouldn't be the way to get ahead. It's because you know somebody. It should be about merit. So in my head, I was still thinking, huh, okay. There were leadership styles that were in vogue when I went through ROTC in the 1970s and early 80s about how you're supposed to lead people. That just didn't, I tried them, but I wasn't the kind of person that was, um, I was a more participatory leader. I believed in asking people what they thought. I wanted to, because I also realized I wasn't the smartest person in the room. I wasn't going to try to pretend I was the smartest person in the room. So I was going to ask people what they thought, and I meant it. I wanted to know what they thought. And if they got out of shock, and she actually wants to know what I think, then they would, they would kind of come along with me. So I had to find a leadership style that worked for me. And that involved including people, being inclusive, listening to people, caring about them as people, and, and making them part of my team. Um, and along the way, I sometimes forgot to just trust my instincts. I grew up in a family where I, I was the first person to go to college and graduate from college. And, but I had a great grandmother who basically had stopped school at sixth grade. But she was one of the smartest people and wisest people I knew. And I sometimes forgot to call on the lessons I learned sitting in her kitchen while she made tea cakes. So you need to Google tea cakes. Um, but I learned a lot from her, and I forgot to sometimes rely on that in the military. So I thought, well, she wouldn't understand this. Well, she really, in many ways, the lessons she taught me were very, very relevant. And then sometimes I was afraid to ask questions, because as I mentioned, there were people around me who already seemed to have figured this out, because of their family history and traditions. They knew a lot of things. They knew the acronyms already. When I walked in the door, I was still trying to figure out, what's a POC? You know, I didn't know any of these things. They already knew these things. Um, they understood how to, you know, simple things like how to make your uniform look really sharp, all the little tricks, and when I came in, we wore black leather boots. I can, I'll never be able to polish boots, so I just could never get my boots to be as shiny as some of those other people. But I kept trying. Um, but I started to ask questions. I started to ask, you know, an NCO, I'd say, hey, how'd you get your boots? What do you use? Or how'd you get your hat to be all squared up like that? And then they would just tell me, I'm like, wow, really? And it was usually simple things. So I realized that asking questions wasn't a sign of being dumb or, or not being good. It was, it was good to ask questions because ultimately I was going to be in charge of people. And then, as I like to explain to people when I give talks to civilians, we train as we fight in the Army, which means people can get injured. People can even get killed in some of our training exercises. So you need to ask a lot of questions. You need to reduce the risk for the people that you're responsible for. So not asking questions isn't a sign of, of being, you know, being smart. To me, it, I think it means you think you know everything and you could very well put people at risk and hurt people because you're being a little bit arrogant and you think you know everything. Next slide. 
So some of those things have finally worked for me, as I said, trying to figure out stuff and learn and kind of build my airplane in flight. Um, I started observing really great leaders. And it, to me, it didn't matter if they were, well, I tried to avoid generals as a, as a, as a young officer. I'm like, ugh, general, I'm going the other way. But I would observe mid-grade officers, NCOs, warrant officers, who I just watched how they, they handled themselves, how they explained things to their, to their people that they worked with, um, just how they did business. Um, one uh, warrant officer that I still remember fondly, Mr. Turk, you always remember people who matter to you, Chief Turk. And my unit at the time was a training, I was in a training division, and our job was to go down and do a, a one station unit training for Benning. I was the S1. And Chief Turk was amazing. In those days, we needed payroll, and I was responsible for, we were responsible for the payroll. I actually, I actually have paid people in cash. Just to tell you how old I am, I actually paid an entire unit in cash. It was horrible. But we had to go and get our payroll in to the, to the office, the finance office, on post. Well, we didn't go in the front door. Chief Turek went around to the back door. Bars and windows on it, and he knocked. One of the ladies looked out, oh, Chief! She let us into the back of the office. And that's how we submitted our payroll. And I, and I said, he said, well, you know, whenever I came down here, I would always talk to the people in the office, ask them questions, bring them little treats and stuff. And I was like, oh, so that's how you do this. He said, that's how you do it, LT. So I learned from a leader how to, again, work with people, value people, meet them where they are, and you get a lot more done, a lot more done. And also read about leaders. I mean, there are some leaders that you may never have heard of, like Joshua Chamberlain. He's a true citizen soldier. Um, was very famous for, well, he was, it was a movie with, that he appeared, at least his character appears in. But he fought with one of the regiments from Maine in the Civil War and um, was, was extremely, um, he was very studious because he had to teach himself. He was really a, a professor, I think, of philosophy, if I'm remembering this correctly. But in any event, he wasn't, he didn't go to West Point. He didn't have any other real military training, but he volunteered for the Civil War and learned, taught himself tactics and strategy. And he also, I think, in many ways was a natural leader, but, but he is one of the people that I kind of revere and look up to. Also, I think a lot about people like Abraham Lincoln. The thing about him was, the people who were members of his cabinet, many of them had been rivals of his when he was running for president. So there's a famous book written by a historian about him called Team of Rivals, and it talks about how he deliberately put these people on his team because he wanted people who were going to perhaps disagree with him, have a different perspective, a diverse viewpoint, um, and maybe they also had agendas, but he obviously knew that. But you can't be successful having people around you who are just going to agree with you all the time. You need to have diverse input to make the entire organization successful. I volunteered for, for challenging assignments. Um, I had an opportunity to have a company command. I again, was in the training division. The unit finally opened opportunities up for females to be company commanders, so we did basic training at Fort Jackson. And um, when I came into the, my first meeting with my company, my drill sergeants, I discovered before I got there, they had done some cross-leveling. The battalion commander didn't want me as a company commander. He made that clear to me after the brigade commander told him he was taking me. And they cross-leveled in the worst drill sergeants into my company. Unfortunately, I had a drill sergeant who actually, as soon as I saw him, I realized he had a cocaine habit. <laughs> he did. Um, I had a drill sergeant who was my, my brother, a Marine, would say he couldn't chase a sandwich up a flight of stairs. He was not physically fit. So that's who they gave me to do, to, to, to do my mission at, at basic training. I was like, fine, okay. What I did was, and this is, I think, sometimes as a leader, you have to be honest with your, with your boss. We had a company meeting. Um, well, first I'll tell you this, as I walked through the company area, I heard one of them say under his breath, she's cute, but can she leave? And I went, oh no, you did not just say that before I could hear you. Okay, fine, I've got this. So, we got them in a meeting, and I said to them, do you all know why you're here? And they looked at me. I said, you know that you were moved around. I said, it's because they think you're ate up. 
they all stopped. I said, yeah, they think, and I told each one of them why they were now in my company. I said, so it's not me, it's you. So I said, together we have something to prove. I said, I'm, gonna, I'm with you. I think you have the potential. We just have to tap into it. And I really got them to buy in. And I actually almost, back, this is back in the days when there were segregated, we didn't have integrated trainings. We had female and male co companies in basic training. And I almost had them talked into taking a female company. Because I said, explained to them, I said, and my first argument was also female. So they just thought they had been given, they'd been given all the bad cards in the deck. But so I said to them, here's how this is going to work, or could work. She and I can tell you how to get through this. We can tell you all the games that might be played. They can prepare you so you can do a good job. And after a while, they were like, okay. But we told them about our experiences, how we had not been encouraged to join, how some family members still didn't want us in the military. I said, those young ladies that are coming to you are coming through some of that same trauma. So you need to be ready to support them. And they were all in. And they were actually disappointed when the Italian commander did not give us a female company. <laughs> so they were like, man, we could have done that. I said, yes, we could have. When I got these assignments, I made sure I exceeded expectations. I, again, was going to ask a lot of questions, learn everything I could, talk to people who've done this before, draw on their knowledge and experience. I was determined to do the best job. And I think we all benefit from a culture where we can't afford to have average followers or leaders because what we do is serious business, it's dangerous. So we can't just have average people show up. You've got to be above average. Trusting relationships. There's a tendency, I think, to build trust above you. I think it's more important to have it with the people who work with and for you because you're a team. So they have to trust that you have their best interests at heart and they have to see it. Don't just tell them, you have to show them that you really mean and you really care. I work for people who, they knew my name, but they, maybe they didn't know, you know, something personal about me. And I often, my husband would say I was being nosy, but I would find out information about people. But when you see them, we'll say, so, how did your son do when that, you know, on that, you know, that test that he took last week? He said, yeah, he was having a chemistry test. He was worried about, yes, ma'am. And then they would tell them, so they know you really care about them. It doesn't take long. And, you know, you don't have to write, take copious notes. Just know your people. Really know your people. Um, and then, and this is one of the most important points, never, ever, ever compromise your integrity. As officers and enlisted soldiers, you take an oath to the country, but I think you also are taking an oath at that time to your fellow service members to do the right thing. I had an experience where I was in a unit in the Army Reserve. It was a school battalion. It was an NCOES, so we taught AG finance courses. The unit covered eight states. The battalion commander um, lived in Boston, Massachusetts. I lived in New Jersey. And we trained at Fort Dix, where we taught our classes. That was our AT site, annual training site. So. He had to travel whenever we had meetings or conferences of that, and things like that. On one particular occasion, we decided to have a conference for all of our instructors. We had like 120 instructors. So I'm, I was battalion S3 slash XO, because they didn't have two of us. They had me doing both jobs. So we went down to Fort Dix to have this conference. Back in the old days, we didn't have electronic um, uh, expense reports and finance and vouchers. It was all paper. So everybody filled out their, their, their vouchers, and I was the certifying officer, SEF, Battalion S3, XL slash. So I'm signing everybody's, well, at the last day of the conference, it's a Sunday afternoon, I'm going through signing everything. And everybody's already, you know, you know there's a thing that says you, you attest that what you're submitting is true and correct. So I'm just trusting that everybody has done that. A couple days later, Command Sergeant Major, she calls me. She says, ma'am, I, I got to report something to you. Several NCOs noticed that it appeared that he was trying to claim reimbursement for things that he could, should be reimbursed for. His business that he owned, his uh, clients had paid for him to come to a meeting. And he, they'd flown him to Newark, not the Army. Um, he was picked up at the airport 
by one of my NCOs that I did not know about, and then he was trying to claim mileage for a rental car. So all this was on this rental module that I had now certified. And I went, oh no, this, is, this can't be. So I had seen it, so I called our, our unit administrator, which is a civilian GS9. I said, can you pull it and tell me what it has on it? And when he told me, I said, this is fraud. I have to report this. He had known me, the administrator had known me since I was a, a first lieutenant. He was a retired CW4, another warrant officer. And, but he said, no, man, you don't you really don't want to do that. I said, yes, I do. He says, well, you know, if you report this, they're probably going to come after you. And I went, I don't care. This is wrong. And I screwed up my courage. I knew the battalion commander was having a, a Tuesday meeting at his, at his brigade headquarters. I'm sorry, the brigade commander was having a meeting. So I called the brigade commander, demanded to speak to him. Um, he just so happened to have the GA for our division in his office with him. So I, he would be like, I said, sir, I actually can report, and it's very upsetting. And I was almost in tears because I felt so, I was so angry and upset that a fellow officer had violated a trust. They were trying to defraud my government. I'm a taxpayer defraud and lie. And so I was actually almost in tears when I reported to them what had happened, what I found out. And I, in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, they could, they could come after me. They could decide I'm the bad person and they could decide to just ruin my career. But I just said, I can't do this. And so they said, okay, well, you mostly, some of you will become familiar with what's called a unit status report. And as Italian S3, I had to prepare our unit status report. Well, the briefing for the unit status report was in about five days after this all happened. Well, a day or two later, I got a phone call. Um, the battalion commander had been relieved. Now that's an unusual thing that happens in the reserve, and I don't know if it was actually legal, but they basically said, you're no longer the battalion commander. And maybe they called the car, the chief army reserve at the time, and told them, we're removing this guy. Well, now I was the acting battalion commander, and I had to brief the USR. Well, I had been prepared, so it was in my head, but I was also a relatively mid-grade major, and I'm in a room briefing the two-star. I was terrified, um, but I got through it. Um, there were a lot of other tank commanders there who were looking at me like, where's your boss? I don't know. I was not gonna disclose, I knew where he was. And I did the briefing, and the CG complimented me, and kind of, obliquely referred to the fact that I was the acting battalion commander because something had happened to the commander. He didn't tell the room in general, obviously, because the investigation was still underway. But that was hard. I was scared. I was concerned. But I knew my NCOs, several of them knew about it, and you know, if one NCO knows something, all the NCOs knew about this. But that wasn't the real driving force, as I said. It was I was offended that someone lacked that, the integrity and honesty and they were trying to defraud the government. So I know that's gonna be hard. It, can t it takes a lot of moral courage, because yes, there are people who will think that you're the problem and not the person you're reporting, but I feel very strongly that what, again, makes us unique as a military is that we have standards. We have the Army values. Not everybody lives those values, I get that. But I always took them very seriously, and this is the one big point that I always, always followed throughout my career, even after that point, and I'll talk about that too at the next point. Next slide. So, as I said earlier, you know, working hard, everybody tells you that, and that's what I thought, just work hard, you'll be, it'll be okay, people will notice. Sometimes people do, and sometimes they don't. That's just a fact of life. Even if you're not in the military, you can be in a civilian organization, and the same thing can happen. You can work really, really hard, and people will not always value your contribution. They're gonna take care of their, their buddy over here who may or may not merit the next promotion. You, in fact, do. But persevere, don't give up. Because there's gonna be people out there who recognize that you're doing a good job. Like the people who decided that they wanted me to do certain projects because they saw that I cared about soldiers. I did my homework, I planned, I prepared, I communicated. And Obviously, if you're a senior leader, you want someone to do a good job because it makes you look good later on. So you're gonna, you should pick the people who know what they're doing, and you should, as a leader, reward those people when they do a good job for you. Take care of the people around you, and that absolutely means people above and below you, at your peer level, just take care of people. You may not know today whether it's gonna matter, but people will remember, 
They'll remember you, they'll remember what you did for them. Sometimes I know it's hard to have fun <laughs> and, and keep your perspective. But I really enjoy most of my time in the Army. To say I met some great people, I had some amazing experiences that I could not duplicate anywhere else. It made me grow as a person um, and, and, and dig deep sometimes and do things that I was really scared of. Airborne school was really scary. <laughs> it was very scary, but I made myself do it. Um, and then some things that I tried, and I wasn't always successful in asking myself, like who deserves or needs praise or encouragement today? You never know if somebody's having a bad day. And it'll take, it takes a minute. If you see somebody's doing a good job, hey, I noticed you did blank. And they don't even have to work for you. Just let people know you appreciate them. Because someday they might be working for you or with you, or you might be working for them. So it doesn't, it doesn't cost you anything, and it, and it takes just a second. Does my behavior motivate or does it discourage other people? This is toxic. It's about toxic leaders. There are people I know who believe that they get things done by pushing other people. And I think in their mind, they think they're just pushing them to be better. But it crosses over the line into toxic. You can embarrass people, and this is one of the rules, is you don't correct people in front of other people. It means certainly not in a harsh way. You may make an on-spot correction, but there are ways to do this in a tactful and diplomatic way. You don't embarrass people, because that's not gonna motivate them to do better for you in the future. That's, that's absolutely the wrong thing to do, and I have seen people do that. So if your behavior should motivate people. Say, so, you know, so-and-so you did this, but Maybe next time think about doing it this way. I mean, you're still giving them constructive feedback, but you're doing it in a way that, as I say, I would want someone to do it to me. So it's kind of like the golden rule. Treat people the way you would want to be treated. Yes, you can get people to work for you if you're toxic, but I, I don't think you're getting 120 or 150% out of those people. You're getting enough so they get by, and they avoid your wrath, and they stay out of trouble. That's exactly the wrong way for an organization to excel, is that people are not going, they're not all in. They're just trying to keep you off their back and stay out of trouble. And do I really listen to other people or am I just waiting for them to just finish talking? That's, that's a, just think about it. How many times have you been in a conversation with your friends? And you know, your long-winded friend is just going on and on, you're like, oh, I just wish we'd just get to the end of the story. Um, but maybe there's something in the story you could have gained, some value you could have gained if you'd actually been listening to them. And as a leader, I learned early on, as, especially as I got to be a senior leader, um, I needed to listen. I needed to listen and not talk very much. Let my people share their thoughts. Encourage the people in the back of the room who were doing their best not to be seen. I think you have something you want to say? I'd like to hear it. Um, don't just wait for people to stop talking. Really listen to what their, their input is. And that can be hard. I mean, I, I get impatient. I had an employee who worked for me my civilian job. He was an IT guy, and Matt talked so slow, I, I thought I could go out and get lunch and come back and he'd still be talking, explaining his thought. But I just learned to sit on my hands and let him finish, because there was value in what he, what he had to share. And then, would I want to work for me? That's the big question. Would I want to work for me? So all the things that are ahead of that on the list kind of feed into that. Do I motivate people? Do I give them encouragement? Do I, pra do, I, do I praise people? Would I want to work for me? Is this a person I think about at the end of the day? Yeah, I'd like to work for, for her. I would. Next. And then something, something to think about. That facing your worst fears. Like I said, um, I don't like heights, but I made myself go volunteer and go to airport school. Um, one of the reasons I did it was I didn't see a lot of that time females with airborne wings. And I was like, well, what's that all about? We can go. When I went to, to airborne school, there were 200 people in my company. Eight of us were female. That was a lot of fun. Um, but it was something I was, I was scared to do, but I made myself do it. And I probably should have gone to aerosol, but I, can, I never got around to it. Um, but again, face your fears. Uh, was definitely terrified when I became a company commander because I was afraid of making a mistake. I, you know, I know I always respected drill sergeants, 
because I, I had a former uh, CG who always used to say, before there's a warfighter, it's a trainer. Drill sergeants are the ultimate trainers of warfighters. And so I just so deeply respected what drill sergeants do and how amazing they are with, with, with trainees. Uh, I just wanted to be a part of that. But I also knew what I didn't know. I didn't know about pushing troops. So I, I just said, you know, I'm just gonna go in all in. And I told them flat out once I got their trust, so I gained their trust and told them we were all in this together, I began to ask them lots of questions about, why'd you do that? Why'd you say that? Why do you call him Joe? You know, I was asking them all these questions and they would answer. And, and I think they were, I was genuinely interested. And so they really, really liked that. But that was one of my worst fears. That was my first command. And the second time I, I had a command, a battalion commander, I was a little bit more comfortable. I was still, again, worried, because the more you go up the ladder, the more uh, those mistakes can really be amplified. The battalion commanders are responsible for much more things, and, and more money, and more resources, and more things can go wrong. And more people can come shooting for, for gunning, gunning for you. I did complaints, and I had one in my entire career. Um, but you can't worry about stuff like that. You have to do your job. If you're worried about stuff like that, that shouldn't be one of your fears. Well, someone's going to file a complaint. If you're doing the right things, the complaint will be, should be unsubstantiated. So don't, don't get wrapped around the axle and, and do your job worrying about trying to be risk averse and, and, and worry about things you can't, cannot fix, you cannot change. Listen to the voice in your head. Listen to the things you learned, like I said, from my great grandmother who taught me things while she was making and baking and, and cooking. Um, that they, were, they were in my head, I just didn't realize they were there and sometimes I pulled them out. Um, and I would listen to her voice. I, I actually would hear her voice sometimes in my head, or hear my mother's voice um, in my head when I was getting ready to do something. Uh, just could hear them talking to me and saying, you know, you can do this. Or, well, what about this? Try this. And then again, believing in yourself. Believing in your training. We get a wonderful training in ROTC and in throughout our professional military career. Um, some of it I didn't really appreciate at the time. I was not big on the uh, Army tactics. I, I just suffered through those classes in CDC and GSC. But later on, it, you know, it, it, it was important to kind of pay attention and, and learn those things. Um, but um, believing in your training, believing in your abilities, believing in the things that said you learned earlier in life, and and understanding that all those things add, add to your experience, add to your ability to be successful, add to your ability to be a good leader. When I went from a colonel to a brigadier general, was that's a huge leap in, a, in, a, in, in, our, in your career. People tell you it is, but everything changes. As I mentioned, you need to listen as a leader. I learned that lesson early on as a one star. And I, it just it never even occurred to me. I was in a meeting. Oh, I was coming into a meeting and I was walking into my headquarters and I noticed we had a lot of dead plants and, you know, it was, it was early spring and there was a lot of debris and stuff. And I, I made it, what I thought was a casual comment to, I don't know who it was, I said, man, the front of the building is looking kind of raggedy. Two days later, people who have bought plants out of their own pockets and somebody was getting paint. I went, wait, oh, shh, time out. That's not what I was saying. Um, I didn't intend for you guys to, and I made sure I paid everybody back who put money in their pocket because I was like, no, that's not what I was asking you to do. But I realized then, at that level, my words were very powerful. They, they listened to me, boss is upset, we got to fix this. And then they were going to run up and do it. Yeah, you got to be careful. And maybe it even happens when you're, you're a captain. You don't realize when you say things to your folks how they're, how they're processing it. Um, I thought I was just being clear, like, yeah, that's pretty, yeah. Maybe we want to do something, but I wasn't asking them to spend money on their own pockets. Um, talking about integrity, there are lots of ethics rules when you become a general officer, um, and you have it's a minefield, and get training on it. But there are people I know, um, having been in, at the Pentagon and gotten reports of general officers who were under investigation for violating ethics rules. I made it my business to err on the side of caution. So I would not let anybody go pick up anything from me. At the, there's a, you may not know this, but there's a basically a, a clinic in the Pentagon where you can go get treated for almost anything. Um, and there's a pharmacy in there, and I would go get my own medication. I can't tell you how many times I'm standing at the window and a person would look at me like, what are you doing? I'm gonna get my medicine, because it's my medicine. I'm not sending my aide to do that. That's just not right. 
um, my old boss, Valentine's Day, he made a comment, same thing I did. He said, oh, I forgot to get his wife flowers. Somebody starts to head to the door and he says, no, I'm going to get, I'm going to the florist. There's also a florist in the Pentagon. It's like a city. Um, he went down and got his own, because he said, that's you, I can't ask you to do that. That's my job. So it's little things like that, but those are the things that people can file complaints about when they see somebody do that. One time I was working on some project and I was, I worked through lunch, and the next thing I know, one of the NCOs in my office was standing at my door, he'd gone to the, I'll call it the cafeteria, the, 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 yeah, anyway, he'd gone and got some chili for me. I was like, close the door, and I close the door, and I'd say, don't ever do that again. And he's like, but ma'am, you were hungry. I appreciate that, but it's my own fault for not realizing what time it was. It's not your job to go get me food. So, yeah, I could have let him do that. I could have, and probably, in other circumstances, nobody would complain about it. But there's always that one person who might. So that's why I say it was important to err on the side of caution. And again, not only for those soldiers, what right looks like. And yeah, I could, but I didn't. Because to me, it was, it was not right. Um, next slide. And then some, some thoughts. Um, I had to stop worrying about what right looked like. It looked like whatever worked for me. I could not be somebody else. I had to do things that worked for me as a leader. And it might not look right to everybody else, but it was what worked. Um, mentoring. Be open to mentoring somebody who doesn't look like you. Um, and then be a good mentee. And being a good mentee means you have the ability to perform well. If someone trusts you enough as a mentor, to identify you to do a project, and it's incumbent on you to do the very best job you possibly can. Not just because it makes them look good, but it's good for you. Face and fight your fears, I talk about that. Provide and seek stretch assignments. You know, do something that's not in your comfort zone. Volunteer for a project. One, you may learn something new. I learned a lot by doing that, volunteering for things I didn't know anything about. I'm an AG officer, that's my branch. I told someone yesterday, it was nowhere on my wish list. There was field artillery, um, signal, uh, intel. I don't remember writing down AG, but it was okay, it worked out. However, I was a battalion S4, for, and that was how I got my job as a company commander. I walked into the brigade commander, because as the S1, I knew what the rotation was and who was with the next company was coming over in our brigade. And I said, sir, I'd like that job. And since I was gonna be the first, he said, well, I need you to go and do something for me first. And that was to go and clean up this, this one battalion's S4 shop. I knew how to sign hand receipts. That's all I knew about logistics. <laughs> That's all I knew about supply. I, I couldn't even tell you the classes of supply. I know somebody told me later, but I, I don't know what they were. So I said, okay. And what I did was I went down there and I realized that the people in that battalion supply, people didn't respect them. They didn't feel good about themselves. The uh, command sergeant major, they weren't on the OML for going to school, or they were, they were so far down, they might never actually get to go, but then we, would, we would probably run out of money. And so I resolved to go down there and help them, motivate them, let them know they were valuable. We cleaned up the, the S4 shop because it was a mess. I've never seen a messy, but it was messy. And we, we, we got it done. And I loved it better than I found it. But again, I was not a logistics officer. I had to teach myself on the fly. I was reading lots of regulations and trying to figure stuff out and asking other people who were actually logisticians, how do you do this? And so that was a stretch assignment. And I'm glad I did it, because later on in my career, it was, it was a valuable experience. It was good I did that. So even though I was a, you know, an AG officer and people would expect me to follow an S1 path, I, was, I ran a company, was involved in training, I was battalion S3, I was battalion S4. I made sure I had a lot of experiences throughout my career that prepared me for senior levels of leadership. I understood how it all worked, not just my one area, not my branch, but how the entire thing worked. That's really important. And then build on your strengths and definitely know your weaknesses. Yeah, I know my weaknesses. Um, I can do planning, but I'm not a happy planner. I, there are people who I know absolutely love planning right down to the little minutia 
And I'm just like, just give me the 10,000 foot story. That's all I can deal with. I can't do the five foot level stuff. It's too, it makes my head hurt. Um, so I know that's a weakness, but I made sure I surrounded myself with people who really did like that stuff and could really do that. And that's another important thing as a leader. Let your people do their job. So Tennessee, I sometimes think, and I've seen it in units, you know, the whole micromanager thing. To me, that simply is someone who can't let go. Let go. As I said earlier, communicate, be transparent, be clear about what your expectations are, and ultimately, and the biggest thing is give your people the resources so they can do the job. And then your job is to step back and let go. Let go. Let them do it. Because they, they can and they will. And then I mentioned integrity and honesty. They truly, truly are non-negotiable. I think we see these days sometimes people who are not necessarily people of high integrity, not always honest, don't always follow the Army values. I think as, a, as an Army, we cannot afford to let those kinds of things slide. We have to stay laser focused on those things. We have to, as cadets, that's gotta be one of your primary missions. As junior and senior officers, that has to be one of our primary missions. Because again, having talked to people in other armies, foreign armies, they just find us amazing. Our NCOs are truly the backbone of the Army. We can't get her done without our NCOs. Our warrant officers are our subject matter experts. Again, we run circles around other armies because we have people that we've empowered. First, we've trained them. Then we've empowered them to do the things we trained them for. We actually let them do that. We give them constructive feedback so that they get better because that makes our whole army better. And if we stay focused on that, I think we'll continue to be a very admired, one of the most admired militaries in the entire world and the most effective when we, when we, do, when we do what we know how to do. And it's important to root out those toxic leaders long before they make it to the senior levels because they can do a lot of damage along the way. They can ruin people's careers. They can sour people who then leave the army and we don't retain good soldiers because we allow toxic leaders to remain in our midst. Uh, it's exactly the wrong thing to do. And I know it's hard. It's hard, as I said, to report people like I did. But that person, in my view, he never made it. He, he left. Um, he, I'm amazed he got to be a lieutenant colonel. But I darn well know I was part of the reason he didn't make 06. <laughs> because I was, I reported him to someone. So he didn't, and he was going to have a successful battalion command because I was his S3, not, you know, boasting here, but I was going to make sure our unit did well. So he would have been able to say, yeah, I had a great battalion command. Well, no, you didn't. You weren't an honest person. So, yeah, I just want to close. My glasses here. Um, I just kind of wrote this down last night as I was thinking. Always remember that leadership is a privilege. Being a leader is a privilege. Not everybody has that opportunity or is in a position to be one. And so when you're in that role, you need to be mindful of the fact that your influence can and will change the trajectory and the career of people's lives. So that's why I stress things like communication, taking care of your soldiers, listening to them, valuing them, providing them opportunities to excel and succeed. Because good or bad, as a leader, you can have you can be very impactful. And if you're not humble about that power that you have, and it really is kind of power, and you misuse and abuse it, you can do great damage. So um, that's really what I wanted to share today. Um, I hope some of it's been helpful and useful. Um, I still, in my mind, see myself as an unlikely leader. I know my high school yearbook did not say most likely to succeed. And I have not been back. I went to an all-girls high school. I have not been back to any of my um, um, reunions. But I'm going to go one time. And I'm going to see what people say when they see me. Because I know they didn't expect this. Uh, I was the last person on there to ever have this, to, to ever be standing right here. Um, but again, ROTC really and truly, and you say it, it sounds corny, but ROTC really did change my life. If I, if I had passed that table by and not talked to that master sergeant, um, 
I, I might have done okay. I probably would have gone on to the law school center, but I wouldn't have the opportunity to develop parts of me that was kind of sitting there on the surface that that kindergarten teacher didn't see when she told my mom I was slow. So thank you for your attention. Um, I'm happy to take questions if there's any time for that. I don't even know what time it is. Um, but um, that's what I have to share today. The Patton Museum Foundation is supported by the generous contributions of you, our patrons. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more programming to educate and inspire future leaders of America, please consider making a tax-deductible donation to the Patton Museum Foundation. To give, please visit generalpatton.org donate, or you can contribute via PayPal, Cash App, or Venmo. This has been a presentation of the Patton Museum Foundation.